When I was 13, uh, my family moved to Illinois and I lived about 10 miles away from Fermilab and uh, the Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois. And my seventh grade science class took a field trip there. And it was Disneyland. It was just the craziest thing I had ever seen in my life. And at one point, they took us into a room and they showed us a video. It was called The Creation of the Universe. And it had Stephen Hawking in it, talking at a point in his life when he could still talk about the Big Bang and, and how far back we could look to the Big Bang itself. And at the end of the video, there was an analogy where they were walking up the steps of a lighthouse. And each step was a factor of 10 closer to the Big Bang. So one step was one second after, the next was a tenth of a second, the next was a hundredth, and so on. And every few steps, there'd be a little shuttered lighthouse window, and they'd open it up, and they'd look to see what was happening in the universe at that moment in time. And they made their way up, and they finally got to the top of the lighthouse, and there was this bright light shining behind the shuttered window. And they said, here we are, we're at the very instant. This is what happened at the very beginning. This is how the Big Bang works. And he goes to open the window and it's, and it's locked. <laughs> and he said, well, we don't know what happened. I was mad. I was 13, but I was angry. He built me up for this big conclusion. But of course, that, that's not a known thing, not even now. But the combination of that visit, that analogy, and again, listening to Stephen Hawking talk about these things in this inspiring way of look at all these things we don't know that we still have to find out. That's how I ended up first as a particle physicist and then later switching into other things. Originally he wrote a paper that said uh, that a black hole cannot shrink in size, it must always grow. But then after a while it became clear that in order to do it right, you had to take into account quantum mechanical effects when you were studying the physics of black holes. And he uh, predicted that black holes will in fact emit radiation purely as a quantum mechanical process. And that radiation was later called Hawking radiation. He is one of the forefathers of how black holes work or that the idea of a black hole or a singularity even exists. I don't think you can solely put that at his doorstep. There were a lot of people, Jacob Bekenstein, Roger Penrose, Penrose Kip Thorne, Kip Thorne um, Wheeler. But he is one of the very small handful of people who did the early work in that subject. And it's kind of fun. I actually teach a little bit about this in my thermal class. Uh, black body, like, so black holes, what is the temperature of a black hole? Black holes are among the coldest objects in the universe. They, um, they're the massive ones. So a solar mass black hole is, is extremely cold. Um, the, the smaller they get, the hotter they are. And so these very, very tiny black holes that you know people were saying might be created at CERN, those are so hot that they evaporate very quickly. So they're, they're, they're so hot that they just radiate away all of their mass you know, in a very short amount of time. There's a whole generation of scientists that I would imagine were around my age Right, who this was when they were in junior high or high school, who are scientists in part or in full because of inspiration from this book. He has a way of phrasing things in a way that make it sound like you are on the precipice of something great and there's just one step away. And I know there's a tendency when you're coming up and taking physics of thinking, well, that's it. Everyone solved everything, what's left, right? I mean, you have to take years and years and years of classes before you find the edge of what we know. This makes it feel like there's edges everywhere and we're so close and if you could just do this one thing you could be the person that pushes over the edge and so I, I think it inspired a lot of people that way. He liked exciting, he liked, he liked making physics exciting for other scientists as well. He was famous for making bets. And as far as the popularization of science, I mean he wasn't the first. Carl Sagan came before, he's not the last because we have Neil deGrasse Tyson now. I think every generation has their own spokesperson for the subject and beyond just his generation I, I think it's important the idea that making science popular and accessible is itself important on top of doing science if if there's a lasting contribution it's the idea that works like this have an enormous intrinsic value uh, and that scientists need to make it a part of their mission to
to reach out and make their discoveries accessible.